The first Playboy Club starts in 1960 in Chicago. It's a private club featuring entertainment and waitresses known as Playboy Bunnies. 60 years after the first private club opens its doors, 200 Playboy Bunnies reunite to discuss this moment in time when they witness a cultural milestone, the pinnacle of Playboy. It's a time when cultural values require Laura and Rob Petrie to sleep in separate beds. But in Hugh Hefner's bedroom, he's running an empire that's changing that culture. It all starts in 1953 with Playboy magazine. The first Playboy Club opens in 1960 at what is now the Knickerbocker Hotel in Chicago. Hugh Hefner hopes to capture the essence of the magazine in a club for members only, a status symbol. I believe the Playboy Club came about because he wanted something special where men, because it was a man's world, and uh, come in and just have a couple of drinks and have beautiful girls around them. To honor the 40th anniversary, former Playboy bunnies from all across the country arrive at the Knickerbocker. After all these years, in the midst of the Me Too movement, have different tastes and societal norms changed how these women view their past? Playboy bunnies who become famous include singer Debbie Harry and actresses Lauren Hutton and Susan Sullivan. A Playboy key and later a key card is required for entry. They emerge not just in places like New York and Los Angeles, but Lansing, Michigan, Omaha, and Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. It ended up being one of the best experiences. Because Tessa Santarpia works at the New York Club in 2018, the last club operating in the U.S. At the time, she's a student at Columbia University. The climate was interesting because it was right in the middle of the Me Too movement. And, you know, I didn't want to go against the progress that was being made for that. But for me, you know, I knew Playboy, the cultural revolution that it was. It was civil rights. It was women's rights. You know, Hugh Hefner was just someone who was not scared to go against the grain and what he thought was right, which was just rights for everyone. This is what democracy looks like! In the Me Too movement, companies don't want to reimburse employees for business meetings at a Playboy club. As a result, the New York Club closes in 2019 after just one year, making Tessa one of the last American Playboy bunnies. Why would she apply? Her mother recommends it. She's a Playboy bunny, too. Some mothers would say, I don't want that to be your mark in life. Sure. Do you understand that, or do you disagree with it, or...? I absolutely understand it. If you do a couple of different things and this is an opportunity to do something for a short period of time and then make your mark in different ways. You don't have to have one mark, right? You can have several marks. Tessa's mother, Susan, works at the Playboy Club in Buffalo from 1983 to 1986. Then she trains horses, works in a jewelry store, and goes to college to get her PhD. She's now a psychologist. Why did you want to do it? So. Part of it was the allure of like the branding at the time. It was really cool and new and what was it all about? And it had some controversy behind it. Um, also, it was extremely lucrative for the time. She says one night in 1984, she makes $2,000. That's $5,200 in today's money. My father and brother at the time didn't make what I was making. I had two cars. I had, you know, I was traveling. On the night of the Playboy Bunny reunion, the beacon shines on top of the Palmolive building just blocks away. In 1965, it becomes the Playboy building, the headquarters for Hefner's operation. It really it was fun. At the time, Candace Bobian knows nothing about Playboy. She's a shy telephone operator when she's offered a job inside an exclusive world of the Playboy Club and works her way up. I worked every level, door bunny, camera bunny, cigarette bunny, living room bunny, playroom where the shows were, and the highest would be the penthouse. The penthouse is the performer's lounge for singers like Barry Manilow. 
And while Playboy exudes all things sexual, these women say that even decades before the Me Too movement, standards are far more strict than the average workplace. The policy was really strict. We had room directors, and if anyone would touch you, they would be escorted out of the club. From the 1960s to the 70s, Sandra Costa works in the LA club. We've all got the sexuality still, because Hefner installed that in us. She trades her bunny ears for a hard hat, working in architecture and design. She says her experience in the club prepares her for big business with mostly men. Anybody who's smart always keeps sexuality in their relationship. And one of the things that Hefner taught us girls to do was uh, to be feminine and not to be a till of the hun in a dress. One bunny decries the treatment from the company and customers as degrading and sometimes vulgar. Her name, Gloria Steinem who goes undercover as a bunny at the New York Club in 1963 to write an expose in show magazine called A Bunny's Tale. It's made into a movie in 1985 starring Kirstie Alley. Does this mean I'm a bunny? Some of these girls don't want to bring up those memories. More recently, a 2022 a and &E docuseries portrays Hugh Hefner as a predator who fosters a cult-like atmosphere. Playboy says it supports those accusing Hefner of sexual misconduct, and the company is no longer associated with the Hefner family. But these women say their experience was different. Diane Peterson works as a Playboy bunny in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. She says what Me Too fought for, she already had. It was a means to an end for me. I really wanted to go to college. They have a great work structure, tons of rules. They give you a really good sense of worth ethic. But that only worked if you were pretty. Um, we were different because some were amazingly pretty and then some were pretty. Some looked like the girls next door. The Me Too movement, I just wish they'd mind their own business because some of us don't want what they're pushing for. There are women out there who would say putting on a bunny outfit is, I don't know, demeaning, demoralizing. Yeah. Do you understand that at all? Do you disagree? I do understand it, um, but that's through the lens of you're putting it on to entertain men, which I think is the initial reaction but I mean we wore it for us sexuality judgment money harassment there are many issues here and many differing opinions on how they fit together and having that support to help lift women up or Denise Rothheimer is a women's rights advocate and crisis counselor for the county of DuPage the members who are males are referred to as key holders and so you're looking at someone who is sitting in a position of ownership and then you have the women who are bunnies who are really sitting in a position of possession. You go to the pet store, you buy a bunny. She says the Me Too movement still has a lot of work to do, and a good start would be women reserving judgment and supporting each other. There are women in society who do want to use their appearance for the means of whatever success they want to achieve. And that's fine, that's, that's their prerogative. But then it can make other women insecure. So then you have this competition. We have not yet found that happy medium to balance it out so that women can become empowered, so that we can lift each other up, one another, be safe from any kinds of you know, sexual exploitation, victimizations, uh, where we can have that uh, economic opportunity for growth without having to sexualize our appearance. For these women, the Playboy Club reunion is a fond reminder of a turning point in their lives, a special key of their own that opens doors to new opportunities. But in the post Me Too era, the club is now a relic of the sexual revolution, a time capsule that some hope will never be unearthed again. Up next on Backstory, the debate about statues of famous figures. One artist offers a new look for public art. 
And in the WGN time capsule, JFK's visit to Chicago.